Welcome back to another episode. This week we are going to discuss story archetypes and story narratives. So we're going to dive right into structures of stories. Lost in the pages we wander the trails With words as a guide A spirit sets sail through magical stories We embark on a quest Unbound book babes we journey our best Kristen. Bobby? Do you know what an archetype is? I have no idea. I tried to read through the show notes and educate myself, but um, I fell asleep. <laughs> so, story archetypes is the plot and the type of journey and issues the characters will overcome. But they speak to the world of the story and create a roadmap for the storytelling. Not mm. to get confused with character archetypes, because characters have archetypes as well, which is going to be a future episode. Is archetype the full word for character arc? Google. I think I did. Google we just figured something like, out. I love this character arc throughout the story. And I was like, oh, yeah. Like how they change and grow as a person. Yeah, character arc is... I don't actually know how literary stuff works. I just read the, the words in front of me and then hallucinate. <laughs> yes. But as we try to grow as people and, you know. That's so funny that we just clicked all that together. <laughs> and by we, I mean you, because I, I did love this yesterday this and it didn't click, <laughs> it didn't click at all. <laughs> we are going to do an episode on that. Hang tight for that. Anyways, fun facts learned here today. Archetypes <laughs> are why we recognize patterns in the stories, plots, and structures, and that we see these same things across different cultures and different time periods of writing. Mm, so it's not aliens. Interesting. The Anunnaki are not involved. Go watch our episode <laughs> about the Anunnaki theory and SJM that we have. It's actually honestly pretty good. It's hey, but wildly unrelated. <laughs> I know, sorry. You brought up aliens. It's not terribly <laughs> left feels. Um, okay, so I want to give some example. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm tisking a lot. That's an apology to editing Bobby because I have to remove all my ticks. <laughs> Uh, sorry, girl. Uh, Got to keep you employed somehow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't make any money at this yet. <laughs> so examples of story archetypes. So there's the rise or rags to riches. This is like Cinderella type themes. Quest. So this is like God killer, right? She starts out on this journey and she has a task and there's these task along the way, right? It's They're building off of one to the other. First she has to do this, then she has to do this, then she does this, then she goes here, and then she fights this thing. You know, I don't know if she fights, I mean, she fights a lot of things. Rags to Riches um, is a very common story mm -hmm. archetype. However, my understanding of history is that, like, prior to capitalism in America... I could be totally off base on this, but prior to capitalism, you were just kind of born into a level in society and mm -hmm. that's where you stayed. Yes, there's also a different archetype that is called the fall, which is riches to rags. The starting at that, hmm. you know, inherited sum. You inherit it only to find out that you have all these debts you have to pay back, you're destitute, and then you start a business and now you have money again. Or... That's both of them, I guess. Took it too far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a full circle. There's that too. That's to actually riches. that's actually a narrative structure, a circular narrative structure. We'll talk about that in just a second. Okay. <laughs> and then the quest is like a video game. Yes. Where you have little side quests on yep. your way. 
There's okay. Her- okay. so another super common one, right, is the hero's journey, which is basically the um the Reaper, Year of the Reaper, our book club book, that Harry Potter is also a hero's journey. So there are like 50 plus different archetypes and there's several like literary contributors to, you know, categorizing these archetypes. So like Kurt Van Gutz, Van Gutz, I, Von Gutz. <laughs> He's got six of them. Christopher Booker's he has or Christopher Booker has seven. Ronald Tobias has twenty and George Poultis? Poltz? Pulte? George Pulte. Um, he has like thirty. So they are known for writing these different archetypes within their literature? Some of that, or yes. What do, mean, what do you mean by 36? So, okay, good question. Let's back up. Okay, so these, it, all of these guys have some contribution to literature. Through that, they have read and absorbed literature, and they have gone and said, okay, these are the archetypes. So after them having this, doing Oh, their, they identify them, within, like create them. Correct. Yes, that is exact. Okay. That is a perfect way to say that they have identified over their career and have categorized them to their own terms. And some of them mm-hmm. have found more than others. Now, some of these are across like some of these guys. I think it's George. Let me look it up. Uh, He's like from the 18th century. Like, so that's how far back some of these structures go for suggesting the different or identifying the different archetypes. I mean, the human experience is, although there's 7 billion of us or however many, as unique as we want it to be for all of those storylines and arcs to fit into 50 categories. Mm -hmm. It's just the human experience. We're not as unique as we think we are. Yeah, exactly. Because some of them mention the same exact ones, but call it something different, basically. And the one, the index that I found the most fascinating is the Arne Thompson Uther Index, or also called the Dewey Decimal System for Fairy Tales, where they have gone through an Eastern, or not Eastern European, just European folklore. And about 2,500 different traditional stories and made this index of these different things that are included. So it truly demonstrates across different cultures and time periods how similar these things are. Again, like you said, the human experience isn't that different for a lot of us. Fascinating. Yeah. So 50 archetypes, but some of them can probably be condensed down if they're similar enough. Yeah. Or they're the same but different names. Yes, yep. You kind of see that in the narratives too, which we'll get into in a second, because you have the story archetypes, but then you have the narrative of that archetype. And those are different? So, Oh yeah, narrative would be like how it's told. Yes, so it is the combination of the characters, places, events, and the timeline the author presents them in. Mm. So you have these archetypes of the overarching theme, and then right below that you have the narrative structure of how all of these elements that they're creating brings you on that journey. Oh, wow. Yes. Yeah. Before we jump any further into the narratives, though, these different the different archetypes, they have stages in them to bring you along. So they end up pairing really well with narratives because narratives are all about the story structure. So how you utilize each character, person, place, or thing to, in certain sections, to get to your point of your story or send your message of your story. So there I want to give some examples of narrative structure because it starts to make some of these you'll identify with from like 
school, right? Things you learned in English. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just gonna wet my, wet my whistle. So, ah. Sipping ASMR. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't hear it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> who knows if they will. I'll find out in editing. So one example is a class, they call it the classic story structure. So this has seven parts, the exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, resolution, denount, denoutment? Denoutment. Is that what it is? De denoutment? It seems strange. I would just like, I want to call it the <laughs> end. <laughs> seems strange to have seven parts, but I don't know. All I know is I'm the denouement sounds to me, as uneducated as I am about this stuff, it sounds to me like that's the, um, like, why wouldn't you just end with your resolution? Why is there more after that? Denouement. It's denouement. I, I thought it was oh, maybe it? French. Denouement. Denouement. Did it give you a translation? I just put it in Google and then clicked the speaker button and it pronounced it for me <laughs> does it give you a translation of what that means in english it's the same word like the same spelling but the definition is that what you're looking for i guess yeah <laughs> the final part of a play movie or narrative in which the strands of the plot are drawn together and the final matters are explained and resolved i get it so there's a resolution and then there's like another chapter that's like ties it all together it's like, maybe it's like in, um, I just finished CJ Archer's The Eighth Cleopatra Fox, and it's their mysteries, and their murder mysteries, and there's a resolution where she solves the murder, and then they identify the person, but she goes on to explain exactly how they figured it out, like, Mm. while they're like, like why they did it yeah and they're like a caught as they're accosting the person that they've identified it like all comes out like the it was in the library with the candlestick kind of thing mm. <laughs> this is where in my personal opinion authors try to get too fancy and too plot twisty and then mm. that's where it all falls apart endings are hard though endings are hard but don't i know it's a fancy french word but don't get fancy in your denouement. The good pronunciation. I don't know how to say it, so it I just good. trailed I think off. it was good. <laughs> I thought it was good. I was like, she was on to it. Um, okay, so another <laughs> narrative structure is the hero's journey. So not only is that an archetype, it's also the structure. They kind of go hand in hand. Um, because mm -hmm. the hero's journey has three stages. There's a, a departure, initiation, and return. But you achieve those three stage, stages through 11 steps. So the stages are kind of the archetype. But these steps are very critical to building that. And some of these steps can kind of be shuffled like before the other and stuff like that. There's some argument in my reading, which I link the sources that I'm using in our show notes on our website. Um, in my research, I was my understanding was the, some of these 11 steps can be shuffled to design your world and everything. So the 11 steps are a call to adventure, a refusal of the call, meeting a mentor, crossing the threshold, facing enemies and adversity, building up to the climax, facing the climactic ordeal and receiving a reward, returning to the ordinary world, undergoing some type of transformation and decimating the newfound wi wisdom. Disseminating. I was like, that's not the right word. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Decimate. decimate the information. Actually, you know what, though? If you have an anti-hero, they might decimate some stuff. And I mean, it's your 11 steps. You get to, you get to decide if your character 
it's gonna decimate that new information and just like nobody gets to know about it or disseminate it it could be bad stuff right like i keep i think the hero's journey the easiest for example that's on everybody's mind is crescent city mm. and so our hero disseminating the information of like the the stuff in the water mm -hmm. sharing that information with people but also decimating the information about how to travel through worlds so as you learn information on your journey it's important that you discern a lot of d's whether you <laughs> you have to discern whether you're going to disseminate or decimate the information you've acquired We like a Which is also an alliteration. What's an alliteration? It's when you use the first, the same first letter to work through a sentence. When you discover diminutive directions, you disseminate to... Dudes. <laughs> dudes <laughs> okay okay i couldn't think of a d word for a group of people <laughs> dudes <laughs> honestly though good job good job okay so challenging and forced <laughs> yes so you gave a great example of the hero's journey there there's a three-act structure which is why I, I think we like learn as children really there's you know act mm -hmm. one act two act three there's three main parts it's the setup the confrontation and the resolution right and you always are like you always see this in romance books there's no third act breakup or yeah third act breakup you know it's you're good mm -hmm. i'm uh, not a fan of those breakups when people get together and then break up in romance novels and then you just know they're going to get back together not a big fan of that Stick with your three acts. <laughs> yeah, I... I don't know. I don't... It's very rare that I read those type, those ones. You know, I just... I'm not drawn mm -hmm. to them either. The seven-point structure. So this, of course, as the name implies, also seven parts. Hook, setup, catalyst, debate, break into two, confrontation, resolution. Hmm. If you want to see more content like this, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified every time we upload. It really helps us out. The next one is... Wait, let's go back to the seven-point structure. So we have 11 steps, and then we have seven. What are we missing in the seven-point that they don't have, that they do have? Refusal to call, right? So our seven-point structure doesn't have the refusal of your destiny. Um, mm -hmm. And it doesn't have meeting a mentor. Yeah, I think those are because those are just so specific to. Yeah, I guess you're right. I could see I could see with how nerdy people are. And maybe that's a bad word. Um, how there would be so many structures when at the end of the day, they're so similar. But they're just out here vying for clicks and likes to be like. Well, mine has 11. Well, mine only has seven. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like some, so many of these structures go back far and above before there was even social media and people vying for clicks. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but people have always been vying for attention, right? Oh, and their sure. little five, five minutes of fame. That means. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what they, outside of their five minutes of fame, I don't know what they were like fighting for a gold piece or last rack of lamb. I don't know <laughs> what the equivalent is for likes and <laughs> likes and shares <laughs> versus <laughs> a pint of ale. <laughs> but they were obviously arguing, and I'm, I'm being. I can't think of another word for mean, but I'm being mean and saying like they were just fighting for attention. Oh. Being like, I think it has 11 steps. No, I think it has seven steps. 
I see what you did there. <laughs> like, I guess that is why this is like literary degrees are four plus years and not a 45 minute video on YouTube. That would be correct. That is an accurate uh, statement. This is just a high level. There would be more to talk about then. (laughs) This is just, yeah. Significantly more, of course. Um, (laughs) So I found this one pretty interesting. It's called the snow. (laughs) I don't know what happened to my voice right there. Hold on. You okay? (laughs) Have you ever seen that video of the girl who drinks Sprite? (laughs) And she's like. (laughs) (laughs) demons leaving your body i can't do it (laughs) (laughs) okay so this one i find pretty interesting it's called the snowflake method this is where it's like a prompt expanded exercise for writing you start by writing a single sentence And it's a summary of the story's overarching premise. And then you elaborate that single sentence into a paragraph that describes it in fuller detail. And then you turn it into one page, story synopsis. And then you construct a character chart. And then, and so there's like these several different prompts that you go through to write and put your ideas on paper. But it's, it's very much a prompt mess like method wow it it seems kind of fun to do it seems like a really fun activity i'm pretty sure they probably did it that in creative great. writing right like i feel like that would be a great thing to do in a creative writing class and i feel like that's probably how a lot of books start right is a single sentence of an idea Mm-hmm. maybe more maybe you need a little bit more to get an 800 page book out of it um I don't know. I've, I've only ever written corporate emails. Um, <laughs> those usually start with one single thought. <laughs> uh, don't write me a paragraph, though. <laughs> Give me bullet points. Also, if there's any corporate baddies currently watching, um, bullet point. Bullet point your goddamn emails. Stop sending me paragraphs. Five act structure. <sighs> It's five steps, intro, (laughs) rising action, climax, falling action, resolution. That's my favorite. Mm -hmm. Short resolution. Falling action, short, short resolution. I know a lot of people love their happily ever afters and they're like, where are they nows in the prologues or the epilogues? Mm -hmm. Um, Not me, man. Journey's over. Cut it off. Ferris Bueller's day off. What are you guys still doing here? It's over. Go home. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. The Disturbance and Two Doors. This was interesting. It is a way to create tension in common fantasy. It is, and it's actually used in the Broken Blade. So this concept is that they're presented with a choice that's going to have two very different outcomes. And they have, so like, there's something that happens like some big event and then there's two options and they lead to vastly different storylines essentially like if they did one of these things Mm -hmm. this would be the end result but if they chose this this would be the end result and so that's what it is so this is used i think because like you can use some of this stuff some of these together right so you can if you had Mm -hmm. the five act structure you could put a disturbance into the rising action section right a disturbance in two doors into the rising action to kind of lead to whatever that climax is you know you know who does this the best goosebumps choose your own ending (gasps) oh yeah (laughs) yep I forgot all Pick about your own that. adventure. <laughs> that is really funny. Oh my gosh. But that's also a really fun philosophical one, right? Where you're like, man, in an alternate universe, I went left instead of right. Mm-hmm. And then all of these. Yeah. That could be a fun one. How do they use it in Broken Blade? I'll just have to read it. We'll just you're going to have to. It's really good. I think you should read it. You'll notice it right away. It happens in both books, actually. Mm. There's a p- point in each book where this happens. Where there's like a left and a right fork in the road? Mm-hmm. 
Yep. And do they acknowledge it? They acknowledge that like there's a choice, yeah. Life this way, that way. Yeah. If I mean if I do this, then this will happen. Yep. Mm. Uh so this one, the story circle, this is what we referenced earlier. So this is eight stages and it's specifically used around a character's choices and where they start in one place and they go on a journey and they learn something and only to return to the beginning place to apply to their knowledge. Really good example of this, it takes it through the entire series, is Throne of Glass. She starts out mm. as she's, you know, she's an... I keep thinking of Otterland, <laughs> like the the book, <laughs> the audiobook is like Otterland. <laughs> so we're just gonna go with it, Otterland. So she starts there, but the story actually started back in in Terrison, right? So, mm -hmm. and that's where we end as well. So that's such a good example of this massive journey that happens. Um, so, so, so these narratives can also happen across series, right? So not only just in like yeah. a 400 page novel, it can be taken and spread out very long. And, you know, and actually, as we were going through some of these, I was like, oh, this book in that series is this one, but the overarching narrative of, is this one. So the story circle, it feels to me like a great, um, archetype to use for a revenge story mm, i think yeah yep and i also just like the balance of starting where it finishes what's that called uh symmetry mm, yep balance there's probably another word in there i'm missing but it starts where it ends mm -hmm. i like the yep there's the punisher oh yep that's yeah where his family dies, and then that's where season one ends. Sorry, spoilers. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so, there is Freitag's Pyramid. And I swear to God, it's the same thing as Five Stages. Like, I don't... Mm -hmm. They have got to be the same thing. Because when I was reading them, I was like, sounds like a lot like the Five Stages. Okay, next. <laughs> There's inciting incident, which is around a single. <laughs> single. <laughs> a single event that has the protagonist setting off on a journey that disturbs their status quo, like shooting a wolf with an arrow. Uh, it has six stages. There's the status quo, the inciting incident, the response, the journey, the climax, the resolution. This is very much the f A Court of Thorns and Roses. Can you imagine the climax being that you can't read? <laughs> Can you and then she doesn't even story. get a true climax till the second book. The uh, storyboard at Climax, it just says illiterate. Do <laughs> <laughs> you writing this whole book and you have just this storyline and they go on these adventures and they hit all six stages and the only thing your readers remember is that this 18-year-old girl was illiterate. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Uh we don't get to choose what our readers identify with. Mm. You just get to tell the story, but you don't get to know how they're going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> it's once you write it, it's really no longer yours. It's now theirs to do as they will with. As they will with. And um, they're going to mispronounce the character names. They're going to take out the smallest, tiniest details that you're like, that's a throwaway detail. <laughs> I just needed it to move the story along. And they're going to cling to it. And they're going to cling to it. This is the world we live in. <laughs> there is Petition Curve. Oh, sorry. 
No, you're good. I was going to say, do you think we would go on more adventures if we were illiterate? I don't know how we get anywhere. You got to read a lot of shit to get places <laughs> these days. <laughs> a lot of shit we'll read to you now. Mm. We're now on a bell curve of society. Of like, you used to be illiterate and it didn't really matter. And then there's a point where it super mattered. And now I think we're on the back end of that, of it not really mattering. If you can read anymore. You just blew my fucking mind. Yeah. That's terrifying to think about. Go ahead. Sit with that one. You can have it. It's yours now. I didn't want it. I literally didn't even ask for that <laughs> thought. That's going to haunt me. Jesus fuck Christ. Christ did. <laughs> oh, it's my funny story. I got distracted. <laughs> Do you want to tell your funny story now before I tell this last one? Yeah, because it's really funny. Oh, God. Okay. I gotta uh, so when I got to college, so I did like community college and then I had to apply to a real college. And so I had to write a little essay to get into that real college. And they said, look, we'll let you come to this college because we think you'll pay. You're well, like, so you, you're allowed in. However, your writing is so bad that we're going to put you in remedial English class. And I was like, okay. And so I get to this remedial English class and we're all getting to know each other. Um, there's a girl who is from Mexico. And then there is a woman who looks to be of Indian descent from the, the country, right? And so we're writing uh, religious stories because I went to like a religious college. And um, so we're writing about certain religions. And the girl from Mexico says, I wrote about Buddhism. So will you just let me know if I got anything wrong? And the girl who looks as though she's from India looks around and goes, I'm from Boulder, Colorado. I am a Catholic. <laughs> 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 and that was my real life mean girls moment and it was everything I could have hoped for and then I got kicked out of class for laughing too loudly <laughs> <laughs> that's the girl who's excused herself from meetings for laughing so much she's like I gotta go, I Nothing... gotta go. <laughs> my character arc has changed very little it's almost like a flat line <laughs> <laughs> she's like I am who I am I am who I am <laughs> <laughs> there's been little blips in it but mostly <laughs> <laughs> just cruising along okay the next one the last one thanks for hanging in there if you made it this far in the episode uh comment catholic fried shrimp <laughs> oh catholic <laughs> <laughs> yep. either or both Ooh, praying hands <laughs> oh yeah little praying hand emojis okay so <laughs> Do whatever you want. Just make a comment. <laughs> Let me know that you made it this far. Don't leave a comment. Share it with a friend. That too. Do all those things. And like it. Liking is so important Subscribe. for this universe. Click the bell. Yeah. Tell them you want notifications for all it's, of it. We'll only bother you once a week. a lot of work Sometimes twice. Us. Okay, so the last one. Yes. Fichtian Curve. Based on the work of a German philosopher, explains everything, <laughs> Johann Feitian. Gottlieb Feitch. <laughs> Feitch. The Feitchian curve is a narrative structure, and I'm, I didn't do notes on this one. I don't know what happened, guys. There's, it's empty, so I'm reading you verbatim off of this website, okay? It's linked below, yeah. so sites sorted, sorted sites. <laughs> <laughs> Around the, a protagonist's story of self-discovery and perpetual conflict, the story's rising action is a series of crises the protagonist must overcome, thereby building tension until they reach the climax. Often characterized by a story of constant ups and downs, the Feitchian Curve is a gripping story structure used across many genres and formats, including film. Also, this reminds me of the overarching theme of uh, A Court of Thorns and Roses series. How we mentioned mm -hmm. that the previous narrative, it was very much the first book. This, I feel, is very much the entire series. Lots of ups and downs. It could also be for Throne of Glass, too, when you think about it, all those ups and downs. 
I mean, yeah, really, I would say SJM's writing style is very Feichtian. Yeah, she's actually in a, a pretty advanced writer for the, like, point of view that she writes in or the tense that she writes in. We should do that. We should do an episode on that, too. Yeah, that'd be a good one, too. Okay, guys. But yeah, I would say out, learn some because... shit with us. <laughs> We're now an educational podcast, so get a notebook. <laughs> That's a lot. We covered a lot today. Mm -hmm. um, everybody study up. There will be a test next Friday on what you learned, retained. Did you practice? Did you add your comment? Did you share it with a friend? Join our book Ooh, club. Yeah. Link oh my below. god, yes, join the book club. We just recorded that. Oh my gosh. Oh the, god. The book is really so good. good, guys. It's so good. But until next time, keep reading. With each turn of the page, a new world unfolds. From ancient castles to stories untold, we travel through time with the books as our wings, exploring the realms that imagination brings. Spellbound pages, our hearts intertwined, and our